and James was just talking about the New Year's resolution, and I was uh, remembering, and, and also uh, James uh, just talked about this, that people have these resolutions, such as going to the gym, <laughs> and maybe two weeks down the road, they figure out that they, they can't do it or they don't have the power, the discipline to do it. And so we have these goals every year, and the time passes, and sometimes we feel frustrated because we don't have the power, the discipline to keep uh, these promises that we make to ourselves and sometimes to God and to other people. And, and then we feel hopeless because we cannot do what we we would like to do. And sometimes the things are so important to us. They are so vital. They would be so good if we could really keep up with our goals. But we can't. And we feel frustrated. And in our lives, we, we have this, uh, you know, this frustration sometimes things that we would like to do and we can't do them. We want to also change sometimes uh, uh, some traits of our character, some flaws that we want to overcome, and the years pass by and we, we don't have that power really to change. And I want to tell you about something that I learned this year, the past year, 2010. And it was a spiritual awakening for me. It was a new, uh, how to say, uh, um, um, I like born again. And I have, I have uh, born again sometimes a few, a few times already, you know. And uh, it's wonderful because we always can learn something new. And and but this didn't come from uh, the Bible, uh, or actually it came from the Bible, but it was cited not in a Christian book or a sermon. It was a self-help book written by a psychiatrist named David Burns. I don't know if someone here has heard about him already. But he talked about an experience he had with a client and this client was a beautiful woman who for 14 years had suffered from a fear. Fear of being elevators. So she couldn't take elevators. Some of us might think, oh, that's so funny. <laughs> How could someone have this kind of problem? But, you know, for some people, it's really a big problem. And, uh, and she had gone to a psychiatrist for those 14 years trying to heal from that problem. And he was examining her childhood the relationships she had with her parents that might have caused that fear. But still, for 14 years, she wasn't healed from the problem. So she came to Dr. David Burns. And then she asked him, how long do you think it's going to take for me to be healed from this problem? And he said, well, usually it takes about 20 minutes. And she said, well, what do I have to do? And he said, well, all you have to do is to, we have an elevator here in the building, so you just go there and you stay there until you have overcome your fear. And she said, well, uh, I thought that you would examine my childhood, my relationship with my parents, and he said, well, I understand what you're saying. You know, by the way, I would like to because uh, if I would give you this treatment, it would be really good for my business to have you every week and pay me. 
would be wonderful. Uh, but you don't need to. You just have to go there and stay in the elevator while I'm going to be here and I have to catch up with some papers. So while you're there, I'm here catching up with the papers. And she said, but you know, I have traveled here. I have uh, spent mon money coming here and you're just going to stay here? Well, I want you to go with me and, and be in the elevator with me. And he said, but that's the problem. If I go there with you, uh, you can't overcome. Right? You, I, what I can do is that I stay outside uh, in front of the elevator and you go. And, uh, and he asked her, well, what is your fear? What do you think might happen with you, if you when you are in the elevator? And she said, well, I think that the walls might close on me and I might, uh, I might not have air to breathe. And he said, well, what you can do is that when you are there, you touch the walls and, and so you guarantee that the walls are really f firm there, that they don't move. And then you take a deep uh, breath and you see if you can breathe. And she looked to him terrified. And she said, what if I am fearful inside of the elevator? What do I have to do? How can I control my fear? How can I fight my fear? And he told her, well, you don't have to fight the fear. You don't have to try to control. If you try to control the fear, you're not going to overcome it. So what you have to do is to surrender. You have to surrender to the fear. And it's going to go away. So that is a paradoxical truth. And the paradoxical truth, your strength is your weakness. So she thought that by trying to control, by fighting against the fear, she would overcome the fear but she had to surrender. So a light came to me, an insight came to me, and I realized what my problem was with playing the piano. Because I, wa I was always very shy. And people sometimes, they can't believe that I am shy because I am very talkative and I'm, uh, you know, very open. I have this personality. I am a, an extroverted, right? So you can't imagine how someone like me could be shy. But I was always very afraid of playing the piano, uh, preaching, speaking in English. So I would make so many mistakes. And even today, I still sometimes make mistakes just because of my fear. But I even decided not to play classical music anymore because when I played classical music, I was very, very shy, very nervous, very frightened. I remember once when I was young and I was uh, playing in an audition and I had two songs to play, one by myself and another with another pianist. And there were several very talented and good pianist is there, better than me. And one of them, he played, and I thought, wow, after him playing, I think I just have now to maybe to, <laughs> to clean the floor. <laughs> but I went there to play, and I was so frightened and terrified that I would shake from the top of my head to my feet, and even my hands, my arms. And I, I felt completely, you know, I didn't have strength in my arms to play. And I was always trying to overcome this fear, to be relaxed, to be confident, to be calm. And the more I fought, I couldn't really overcome it much. I overcame a little bit but I still had a lot of anxiety. And every time I played the piano, was a war. 
because I was afraid of making a mistake. And then I would try to fight against my fear. I would try to rationalize and I was, I was trying to examine my negative thoughts and combat these thoughts with positive thoughts. But then I became so tired and so stressed of, about combating the thoughts and the more negative thoughts I, com I fought with positive thoughts, the more negative thoughts came again. And then when I read this book, and it's interesting that in this, uh, in this book, When Panic Attacks by Dr. David Burns, he had this Bible text there, even though it's not a religious book, but he put this Bible text that we just had here in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9 and 10. And then I realized that the fight wasn't mine. You know, I didn't have to fight. I just had to surrender. I had to surrender to God and let God take the fight for me. And then I went to the piano to practice and I surrendered. I didn't care about negative thoughts. If they come, that's okay. I'm not going to fight them. I'm not going to try to understand me, to analyze me. I'm just going to surrender. But that's so interesting that when I surrendered, they disappeared. They didn't come anymore. I overcame the negative thoughts, the fear of making mistakes just by surrendering to God. By just taking, letting God work in myself. So you see that your strength is actually your weakness. When you try to be strong, you are weak. There are two things that we do when we try to fight our problems. One is demanding and the other is blaming. When we start the year, we demand that we do this and do that, that we go to the gym, that we lose weight, that we change our diet, that we become more patient, more loving, that we separate more time to God, to people. So we demand that we do these things. And down the road, we start blaming ourselves because we didn't do the things that we would like to do. So we have these two extremes. One is demanding. Demanding is when you look to the fear, you want to do this. So you demand that you change, that you do something. And blaming, you look to the past, and you blame yourself because you didn't do the things that you demanded to do. <laughs> and there is a vocabulary as well. The demanding vocabulary is have to, ought to, and must. I have to do this. I ought to do and I must do. And also we have the vocabulary of blaming, which is should and shouldn't. I shouldn't have done this. I should have done this. So we are all the time fighting. And what happens? What happens is that it's not by our power. Our power is weakness. You need to understand. Now, I want you to see this Bible text in Zechariah 4, verse 6. So he said to me, this is the word of the Lord of Zerubbabel, not by, uh, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. So you see that when you try to fight, when you... Uh, try to be strong and to demand what happens you're not letting the Holy Spirit fight for you so the Holy Spirit is there just watching you 
So you are really demanding, you are doing so much effort, you aren't getting anywhere, and the Holy Spirit is there. He can't do anything because you don't let him do it. So what you need to do is to let him take over your life. Let him take this fight for you. Surrender to him. So this is a paradoxical truth. When we are weak, we are strong. So let's see that verse again. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. seems uh, easy, but in reality, it's not easy. Because surrendering is very difficult. We human beings, we want to take the prize. We are used to say, I did it. It was me. I can do it. We even listen to this uh, self-help books and things that you can do it. You are great, you are strong, you are intelligent. But that's exactly our weakness. And it's hard to let it go. It's hard to, to let God take control. It's hard for me when I am playing the piano to relax. And just trust God. Put my hands in his hands. I want sometimes to make sure that I'm going to play the right keys. That I'm doing the right thing. And when I try to do that, I become tense. And when I am tense, I really can't play so well. But if I relax, if I surrender, if I let God take control then I have the power. So to have the power, I need to be weak. I need to believe that by being weak, by surrendering to God, I'm going to be strong. So that's a paradoxical truth, and this is why it's hard. It's a big problem for people. People are always trying to save themselves. They are always trying to be strong, to do good deeds, to fight the battle by themselves. It's hard to let it go, to let God take control. And I have another uh, par paradox for you. Our clothes are like filthy rags. <clears throat> and what I mean by that, our clothes are, are like filthy rags. You, you know that when Adam and me and Eve, when they uh, fell, they realized that they were naked. And when they listened to God's voice, looking for them, they tried to, uh, to cover themselves, to find clothes to cover their nakedness. So they dressed with, so they dressed with, with leaves. But do you think that was okay to God? No, it wasn't okay to God. But that's very interesting, the fear of rejection. We have a fear of rejection. It's very, you know, very normal in, in us human beings. So when I am 
playing the piano and I am nervous, what do I fear? I fear rejection. I fear that maybe you guys would start throwing tomatoes at me. <laughs> and then some, after the preaching, some, someone would tell me, Claudio, how could you have the courage to go there and do such a mess? That's a fantasy, right? No one would ever do this. And if someone would do this, the problem would be with that person. <laughs> That's the logic. But fear is not logical. You understand me, right? When you fear, you're not being logic. But you is still fear, even though it's not logical. You fear rejection. So we fear rejection from people. And when I preach, I also fear rejection. People are going to like what I'm preaching. Maybe they're going to dislike. And we have this fear of rejection towards God as well, as Adam and Eve. They fear to be rejected by God because they had just sinned and now they realize that they were naked. And I don't know if you guys already had this uh, uh, nightmare that you are naked publicly. <laughs> and that's terrible. You feel so bad. So we have this fear of being rejected by God, of not being saved of going to hell. And then what do we do? We try to cover our nakedness. We, we, we start doing things. We start doing our deeds, our good deeds. With our own efforts. And sometimes we become even legalistic. Because we are so worried about being rejected. We have this vision of God as someone so hard, so cruel, so judgmental. So we think, well, maybe I should do this. Maybe I should dress like this. Maybe I should hear this kind of music. Maybe I shouldn't take a shower uh, Saturday because that would be working. Maybe I shouldn't cook. I should do this and that. And then we have so many laws and so many things because we are so worried that we are gonna, we're not, not going to be accepted by God. We are getting so much leaves, so much leaves around us to cover our nakedness. It's so hard for us to come to God naked. <laughs> Isaiah 64 verse 6. All of us have become like one who is unclean. And all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. Like if we go back to Adam and Eve, they were naked and they tried to cover themselves with leaves. But then God came. He killed a sheep. And then from this ship, he made clothes and put over them. So these are the clothes that you need. Not your clothes, but Jesus' clothes. He's the one who is going to dress you. But that's hard to believe, right? That if we are naked, he's going to dress us. We want to dress ourselves because it's so shameful to be naked. We don't want to be. That's the problem that we have sometimes of being vulnerable to God. We don't want to be vulnerable to God as we don't want to be vulnerable to people as well. Sometimes we fear so much being ourselves, somebody might not accept us. So we try to be someone else. Should I say this? Should I be more gentle? Should I be nicer? I remember just yesterday, I was uh, playing a 
at the Presbyterian Church. I went there to practice the piano. And then a woman came right at the end when I was practicing. And then I left church with her. And, and, uh, and uh, she was saying that it was such a blessing for her to come there to church. And I was there and playing the piano. And she could hear me playing while she was uh, fixing the church. And I told her, you know, you don't know that I was always very uh, uh, fearful, very shy. And when I came here before, I was so nervous and stressed that people wouldn't like my playing. And then I, uh, uh, I told her what happened to me, the insight that I had, and that now I am so relaxed and I have, I'm having so much fun when I'm playing at church. And it's so good for me now because what happened before is that I was so afraid of making a mistake. And if I made a mistake, I would be so upset with me. And if someone else would make a mistake, I would be so upset with that person. And I got to church very early uh, hoping that everyone would be there to practice. And then they came late. And I was upset because they came late and I wouldn't have time enough to practice. And now I was stressed because if I didn't practice enough, I, I might make a mistake. <laughs> so that was so much stress going on, so much anxiety. And then after I had this insight about surrendering to God, I became relaxed. You know, if they come late, that's okay. And if they don't want to practice, that's okay either, you know. I just do what I can do. What can I do, <laughs> right? I ca cannot control people. I even found out that I can't control myself. So. <laughs> so when I told her this, she asked me, can I give you a hug? I said, why not? We Brazilians, we not only hug, but we also kiss three times. <laughs> So she gave me a hug. So I, I got a hug yesterday. Why? <laughs> because I let myself be vulnerable. I just opened. I said, you know, you think I am good. I am a, a power. I am, I'm really strong. You know, I am weak. I have these, I had these problems and I still have. So I was vulnerable. And when I was vulnerable, I became human. I became closer to her. Because sometimes when you are so worried about being perfect, about, being, about doing good deeds, about showing off an image to people of perfection, you are not human. You become distant. You may become like superior to people, they, they can't connect to you, they can't have intimacy to you. But when you are human, when you are yourself, you can connect to people, but not only to people, you can connect to God as well. The more you, you have these leaves covering yourself, the more you are running from God and you are hiding from Him, you are afraid of Him and you can't connect to Him until you find out that you can come to God naked as you are vulnerable. And when you come to Him vulnerable, He dresses you with His righteousness, with His clothes. But the thing is to believe that if you are vulnerable, He is going to dress you. But while you don't believe and while you dress yourself, He's never going to be able to dress you. And you will always be naked, though you are trying to dress yourself. <laughs> and the last thing that I want to show you is that our perfectionism is our biggest flaw. Sometimes we worry because we think, well, we need to, to be Right. We need to keep the commandments. That's the way how we're going to be saved. How God's going to accept us. So I need to be perfect. And while we are so worried in being perfect, that's our biggest flaw. <laughs> because it's not by our perfection. It's not by our deeds. It's not by our righteousness. 
It's by God's sacrifice. It's by his grace. He lived the life for us. He was perfect for us. But then you say, but we have to be perfect as well, Pastor. We have to be perfect. Are you? Am I? But they, so we, we are so worried about being perfect. We think we need to be perfect to be saved. We can't accept our humanity. We can't accept our sins, our mistakes, our flaws. We can't believe that we can be saved with our flaws. So we try to be perfect. But while we try to be perfect, we are not. And the more we try, the less we are. But when you accept that you are a sinner, that you have flaws, that you have mistakes, then this is when God changes you. When God transforms you. When you let go of your willingness to be perfect. When you accept yourself as you are. Your humanity. This is when he can operate in you. When he can transform you. This is a paradox. It's very hard to understand. That we need to accept our humanity. And now I want to finish. I want to show you a um, graphic that I have made. This graphic, I'm showing the advantages of being strong and the disadvantages of being strong. So here are the, the advantages of being Perfectionist. Advantage of being perfectionist. I don't need Jesus' sacrifice. I can do on my own. I can feel superior to people. I can boast, as, it, as in the Bible text we saw, I can boast that I have done it on my own. I am good. Uh, I can boast my righteousness. <clears throat> people will admire me, and they might even praise me. So, wow, Pastor, you're so, uh, so godly man, so pure. And uh, let's go to the next one. just want to, people will respect me if I am perfectionist. And I can judge other people. I can say, well, I am better than they are. See, these people in this church, they have so many problems. And, you know, they are so messed up and see how good I am. But. Now let's see the disadvantages of being perfectionist. I will feel very anxious. <laughs> As I told you, I was. I'm still a little bit. I will never feel the joy of salvation. I can't because I'm going to feel hopeless. Inside of me, I will always feel naked. I will see God as a stern judge who is prompt to accuse and punish me. The image I'm going to have of God is a very negative image. I can't see him as a, my friend, my savior. I will have a lot of guilt if I'm a perfectionist. I will be constantly struggling to be perfect and I will never feel like I am good enough. That was what happens when people try to be perfect by themselves. People will feel threatened by my strictness. People will think that I want to put them down and they will resent me because I am always trying to put myself superior to them. And sometimes I even accuse and blame them, right? My superiority will prevent me from being vulnerable and I won't be able to connect to people and have intimacy. And not only to people, but to God as well, right? So now you can see it's a paradox, and I think that I, I am 48 years old. I was born at church. Not at church, actually, but in a hospital from church. Was a <laughs> yeah, even the doctors who, you know, uh, they were also Christian. <laughs> but I really came to, to have a better understanding of this 
this past year by reading this book that I told you. And, and I think that I, I will have more spiritual awakenings in my life because, you know, we are always learning. And this is what happens because it, it seems easy, but it's not. Surrendering to God is an art. So I want to invite you today to let God take control of your life. Stop fighting. Let him fight for you. Give yourself to him. Put yourself in his hands. Have a relationship with him. Let him take control of you. And I'm going to tell you something. Because sometimes we want to feel like we have discipline and we, we work hard. <laughs> Maybe we're going to have to work even harder to surrender to God. Because you're, you're going to have to let it go of this tendency to demand these have choose that you have. But I want to invite you to do this today, to let God take control. Give yourself, put yourself in his hands. Amen. God bless you.